This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Just a little disclaimer before we start the video. Uh, this is indeed my Monday video, only done a little bit earlier, as we wanted to get this out as soon as possible. I might sound a little bit different since I'm currently dealing with a cold. And, on a final note, in this video I'll be retelling the events of the War of Forms campaign. But near the end, we uh, got a little something special for y'all. The collected edition, the short stories, stay tuned, because... Juicy. Right then, onwards to the video. Hello everyone. At the end of Legion, we were able to defeat Argus, and with the help of the Pantheon, we imprisoned the Dark Titan Sargeras. In his final moments, the Lord of the Legion penetrated the world with his swords, not delivering a death blow, but doing some serious damage to the planet. Azeroth is wounded, and her speaker, Mac the Bronzebeard, he goes around warning the world that we need to focus our efforts on healing her, or we might have to start looking for a new planet to live on. Now wounded, she's bleeding a material called Azerites, which is a completely new discovery for most people, except for Jesty Gallywix, whose people, they'd found it all the way back on the island of Kazan. Digging so deep, it might have actually caused the destruction of the little island, but all the same, he presents the new material to his war chief, and upon touching it, she says, This will change everything. <laughs> I told you! This new substance is the most powerful thing they've ever held. It gives you incredibly smart thoughts, strategies will race through your mind, and the Dark Lady, she saw herself no longer as a Dark Lady or even a Queen. She was a goddess of destruction and creation, and she was stunned that she'd never understood how deeply those two were intertwined. Armies, cities, entire cultures, she could raise them, and she could fell them. Stormwind would be among the first, yielding his people to swell the numbers of her own. She could deal death on a scale that... Yeah, her dream of staying alive forever, of never going back to the hell that she witnessed, that has her quickly weaponized as, right? Well, Gellywix, he has his people mind this stuff. Nothing good has ever come out of Silithus. The Alliance finds out about the operations, and while touching it, it gives Anduin a similar feeling of power and strategy. His mind races to how many it could heal, how many could it strengthen, soothe, invigorate and inspire. Yet, how many could it kill? And the thought was a gut punch. There are definitely those amongst the Alliance that would love to use Azerite in an offensive matter. People like Rogers and Greymane. But Anduin, he's pretty clear about his intentions, and the rest follow his lead. All this information is from the novel Before the Storm, and I'll link to a video I've done at the end if you want more details. Now the tale ends with a meeting between Forsaken and humans. A meeting that does not end too well, yet no war was started between the Alliance or the Horde. That war begins with this campaign, where the Horde troops are summoned by the Warchief to the Undercity, as SI-7 operatives, they're crawling through Orgrimmar. Though our long war against the Legion has ended, the Horde cannot afford a moment of respite. Meet me in my chambers in the Undercity, where we can discuss our next move, discreetly. Instead of focusing our efforts on Syllabus, the Bench Queen lets us know that that is exactly what she wanted the Alliance to believe. Instead, we're going to focus on Teldrassil, the home of the Night Elves. Azerite, it has changed the balance of power across all of Azeroth. Though we do not yet fully understand its potential, it is clear that this substance has vast destructive capabilities. She wonders, what will war look like in 20 years? In a hundred? How can the Horde hope to defend its borders if the Alliance controls the flow of Azerite? It's uncertain, but what is certain is that the Alliance will use their Nessus as a safe harbor for funneling Azerite into the Eastern Kingdoms. Enduin Rin will build powerful new weapons, and sooner or later he will turn them upon our homelands. First, he will strike at the Undercity, and then Silvermoon. Then his gaze will fall upon all of Kalimdor. For the sake of the Horde's future, we must be the first to act. By occupying Darnassus, we will be the ones to control the flow of Azerite and ensure that it cannot be used against us. The Alliance would not dare attack its own city for fear of harming civilians. With a single stroke, we will guarantee generations of peace. The best defense is a good offense, and we all know how much of a warmonger Enduin Rin is. Attacking them before they attack us, that is the only way to secure a safe future with someone like him as High King. It's High Overlord Varok Saurfang that leads an army towards Silifus. By now, they've reached the Northern Barrens, where we meet up with him, and we let him know that the preparations are complete. It's time to capture World Tree. Meanwhile, on the Alliance side, we have King Anduin Rin, who's summoning the troops with a heavy heart. Though the Legion has fallen, a new threat rises. Disturbing messages are arriving from our operatives in Orgrimmar. 
Join me at Stormwind Keep to discuss the matter further. Sylvanas' plans of misinforming the enemy faction, that has definitely worked, as they believe that an army is marching on Silithus to claim the ass rights. Heroes of the Horde and Alliance, they fought side by side during the Argus campaign. Order Halls, class members, they've been brought together to stand against the threat of the Legion. To think that Sylvanas is ready to cast the unity aside. Yet Matthias Shaw, leader of the SI7, he shows up with disturbing news. Turns out that our reports were wrong. The Horde has diverted and are marching into Ashenville. The Night Elves have already sent out the forces towards Silithus to support war efforts. They must be halfway by now, and the only Kaldori defenders left that are the Darnassian city guard. They won't last long against an army, so we ride out to meet with our commander, the Laren Summermoon, to buy as much time as we can until the fleet comes back home. We Soldiers of the Horde, ready your blades. Today, we march on the Kaldori. The Horde army moves into Ashenville, where we meet up with Lorash, a rogue that's going to help us sack Essenar. Hundreds of them have already attacked Kaldora outpost across Ashenville. On his signal, they will begin the next phase of this war, sowing chaos. First, let me signal the others to begin their assault. This fire burns with purple smoke. They should see it rise above the trees soon. After you, champion. You mark the safe targets. I'll bring them down. Our targets are the guards in the city, with a choice of not actually harming the civilians. Lorash, he doesn't care either way. He is a bit disturbed about killing a man in his sleep, but he also compliments us for his style and is worried about alerting the guards. Being offered a choice, that's very nice. Yet on the Alliance side, we find out that either choice, it doesn't really matter. Or forces, they came in later and did the dirty work for us, as everybody's dead. The bodies. So many bodies. We tried to set a trap for the Horde. It failed. We could not stop them. Our outposts were taken by surprise. They fell one by one. The guards were poisoned. And the civilians, not even they were spared. I only hope that some managed to flee before. Forgive me, friend. Who did you say you were? Are you the one Malfurion spoke of? There are more wisps than I can count. The loss of life. Merciful Elun, please bless the fallen. Endwin, or Shaw, they were the ones sending us to help her. But apparently Malfurion, he's also aware of this, as he asked us if he's the one who sent us. Either way, we need to keep in mind that with Battle for Azeroth Collector's Edition, we're also going to get two short stories. Both of them, they take place around the same time period, but both of them are told from either faction's point of view. It's uncertain when exactly the events take place, but... If I had to make a guess, I'd say somewhere around this time. If you're not ordering the Collector's Edition, but you do really enjoy the storyline, don't worry, they will be available online for free. Now in the preview, on the Alliance side, we have Elegy, in which we read about the Laren and her troops being attacked by Horde forces, and they discover the ruse. They discovered that the Horde is not actually on the move to Silithus. A messenger is then sent to Malfurion, while another, he's sent out to check how far the Horde has already moved in. It's just a tiny preview, so hopefully more details will become available. While on the Horde side, that story is called A Good War, which has Saurfang in Estrenar. Malfurion Stormraid shows up, to which the orc challenges him to Makura. Knowing that he doesn't stand a chance against the Archdruids, the rest of the troops, they make their escape, while their duel takes place. A duel interrupted by Sylvanas, who saves Saurfang's life. That's all we really have at the moment, and I can't wait for the full version to be released. But it makes sense for this to take place at this point, to take place while we're still at Estrenar. Details unclear, but what is pretty certain is that Astranar falls to the Horde, to which they move on to the already established outpost of Sormgar. We make sure that they're ready to accommodate the might of the Horde, while back in Estrenar, the Laren, she wants to honor the dead and take care of the butchers that still skulk the city. Do you hear the screams? We must defeat the Horde and their vile war chief, though it might cost us death, which we hold most dear. The forest stirs as Malfurion summons the Wisps, like he did in days past during Warcraft 3, to take care of the Demon Lord Archimond. This time, he calls upon the ancestors to form a protective wall and halt the Horde's advance. You will come no further, Banshee Queen. Soldiers, no! Do not rush the- Ah, uh, fools! At least now we know how dangerous the Wisps can be. You may pass through the wall, hero. The Wisps will not harm you. Sylvanas has to deal with an ambush from Asheville Huntresses, and with most of her troops demolished by the wall, she retreats to Zoromgar outposts. 
Malfurion, Horde forces have gathered at the Zoramgar outpost. The Banshee Queen seeks to capture the World Tree. Dalaran, travel to our outposts. Gather every soldier you can find and bring them here. And you, Shando? Sylvanas seeks to engage me, and I plan to give her what she wants. Word has been sent to our fleet. Elun willing, they will soon return. As you command. The ancients call to him, and we must protect him at all costs. The druids of the claw, they rallied for battle, while the blackwood furbogs, they've been driven to madness by the horde's invasion. If left to the madness, they could strike us from behind, while our forces engage the hordes. It pains them to do so, but we must put the creatures out of their misery. Meanwhile, back at Zurumgar outpost, we have Sylvanas, Saurfang and Avanos, who are trying to figure out what to do about the wall. A wall of wisps? Surely it is nothing our Dark Rangers and a few demolishers cannot overcome, my lady. The scouting party I led to Malfurion underestimated the Wisps, and they paid the price for doing so. We cannot destroy the Wisps, not in numbers enough to matter, but we may be able to disperse them. Interesting. The Wisps respond to Malfurion's call. But what if more of the forest were to cry out for help? Precisely what I was thinking. Champion, would you be so kind as to test our theory? Ancient magic. The spirits of the ancestors. It's nothing against a bit of solid goblin ingenuity as we hop into a plane and we bombard the crap out of the wisps and the trees. It seems the wisps are susceptible to distraction. We will exploit this weakness to get past them. Sarfang, take a squad into Felwood. Seek a path over the mountain into Darkshore, but leave the siege weapons under my command. We will squeeze Malfurion from both sides. Warchief, there is no safe passage through Felwood. Find one or make one. Time is a luxury we do not possess. Hmm. No many smugglers, blight collar. I beg your pardon? I am not naive. There is little chance that Everlook receives all its cargo through legitimate means. Someone is using a hidden route through Felwood. Most smugglers would prefer to avoid the attention of the High Overlord. But I believe we can locate one who can be persuaded to assist us. Then it is decided. Sawfang, Nathanos, you will leave at once. While Saurfang and Afanos, they go on their own adventures through Felwood. We meet up with the Banshee Queen, who uses her dark powers to funnel through a small portion of her forces. We pass through the wall on my command. Brace yourselves. Pass through the wall, quickly. I cannot hold it much longer. Once a breach has been made, the pain is bearable just give me a moment the wall will be a problem for a while halting the majority of the horde forces but for now we have enough to push through enough to take the master's glaive from those savage elves Melfurion must be gathering his forces so we press on through the forest the sacred force of the elves both a protective and offensive measure for their land Sentry owls are hidden amongst the trees, spying on our every movement, so we shut the eyes of the forest, while the frenzy furbog, they cannot be allowed to stand in our way. With the eyes shut, only one thing remains, we need to take care of the ears. The ancients, they can feel the vibrations of our footsteps and report our every move to Malfurion. Time to defeat the burning ancient at the grove, where the archdruid finally shows up. Sylvanas! Your foul deeds desecrate this sacred place. Undo Falador! Malfurion, how gracious of you to join us. Who would have guessed that you would come to protect your precious trees? Be gone, witch! No! My eyes! It burns! Where did you fly away to, little bird? The crow has flown, but we've moved enough of our troops to the dark shore to establish a foothold. The local furbog at the Blackwood Den, they will need to be slaughtered though, while the Horde banners, they will rally the troops. But don't worry about it, once we've conquered our nasses, the elders of the Blackwood tribe, they will be thanking us for murdering them. I mean, restoring peace to the den. 
while the rest of her army sets up camp. The dark lady's attention is drawn by something interesting at Nashville. Sappers, gather your gear and follow me. Bring every shredder we have. By the time that the Laren and the Alliance reaches the grove, there's a monster shredder that's trying to desecrate it, so we destroy it before the Ancients of the Forest are taken out, and it's Onu that points us towards the Blackwood Den. The Ancients of the Forest are all connected to one another, and they sense the disturbance, the thundering clamor of war. Soon, their brethren will answer in kind, for nothing shall disrupt the balance of nature. Before that moment, it falls to us to take care of business, and at the den, we can see the remaining Furbalk guarded by the Horde. Their camp has already been built, but it doesn't mean that we can't do a bit of damage by sabotaging their demolishers, while the Elder Furbalk, they're escorted to a safer place. It's Onu that senses which interested the Dark Lady so much, but the powerful force that he's sensing at Nashville, it's actually hurting him. We discover that a massive deposit of Azerite, the dead is the source of his pain. The Horde is already hard at work gathering it, despite Sylvanas who says, Azerite, with this in our grasp, all who dare to oppose the Horde will fall. Proceed with caution, champion. It seems the Alliance has beaten us to it. That ship must have come from Darnassus. Which means... I have a crow to hunt. Bit of a time mix up here. Unless one side maybe wiped out the other and their leaders are unaware. Either way, both sides go in and kick the other faction's booty while also collecting the Azerites. Melfurin and his forces hold the line at Wildbent River, yet we do not stand alone. The Ancients have answered the call, and on their branches we do some massive damage to the Horde. Yet Sylvanas and the Goblins, they've been working hard at weaponizing Azerites, and from the sky they unleash its deadly potential upon the Alliance. Both sides acknowledge that this battle is a stalemate, for every enemy that they slay to replace them on the battlefields. While Ben River is locked in a stalemate, and Malfurion knows it, we must stay the course for now. I will continue leading our soldiers through the wall while we await word from Sarfang. In the meantime, we will do all that we can to keep the Kaldori under pressure. We shall not afford them the luxury of a peaceful night's rest. This is war. The Banshee Queen seems to have forgotten that she's actually fighting night elves. Well, Mafurian, he actually believes that they're too few in number to stand toe to toe. They must fall back and regroup in Darnassus. If we hope to push the Horde out of their lands, we must call upon all the strength that the people have to offer. The Druids, the Priestesses, the Sentinels, all are called to arms to defend their land against the encroaching Horde. Only together can we hope to end the stalemate at the Wildband River, while even the fleet that was en route to Silithus, that makes its return. May the Our way. fleet has returned from Silithus. Elune be praised. Their might is sorely needed. King Anduin will send his soldiers to aid us. We must hold our ground until they arrive. Your deeds will not be forgotten by the Kaldori, hero. The aid you lend in these dark times could make all the difference. May our will be stronger than their machines of war. A war is not won or lost in a single battle. Our day will come. And while we wait for our forces to prepare, we spend our time fighting each other in Darkshore. World Quest, they recruit heroes to aid with finding the enemy, cleaning up some Azerite, continue the fight, with Night Elves proclaiming that they don't even want to fight. Some time passes, until... For the Horde! Sawfang, it's about time. Look around you, hero. What a lovely sight. The wisps are scattering, one by one. The wall comes crashing down. Now is the time. The world tree is ours for the taking. Find Sarfang. We shall finish this once and for all. For the Horde! That sound, could it be? Shondo, the Horde is approaching from the north. The north? How did the... Oh. They scaled the mountains of Felwood. Of course. The Wisps, they're growing disoriented. The wall is failing. Horde forces are advancing upon Lordanel. Champion, to me! It's Lordanel where our next fight takes place. And honestly, the events here, they can take place either way. Either the Horde is first, or the Alliance is first, or vice versa. Or maybe even at the same time, they're very intermingable. 
On the Horde side, we have Saurfang, who made his way across the mountains and is ready to take Lord Anel. This is all that stands in our way before we can capture Darnassus and reclaim Kalimdor. We're told to rout the defenders, but we will not slay innocents. If they do not raise arms against us, we're going to spare them, we're going to capture the civilians, question them, and then release them. Kinda makes you wonder what would happen if a civilian doesn't want to talk. Well, Karana, Briarbow, and Ariel Staggart, they're the commanders in the area. Without their leadership, this force will crumble, so we take their lives with honor. The Alliance, they do pretty much the same. They kill the Horde invaders, they slay two of the Horde's strongest warriors, Gormak Exfall and Rakash Bloodwish. They have led a charge to try and capture our fleet, but we rescue as many civilians as we can. Yet despite our best efforts, the Horde is relentless and Lord Anel is overrun. Securely in the Horde's hands, Saofeng wonders why they haven't seen Malfurion on the battlefield. He would never let Lord Anel fall without a fight, so he must have gone after the Banshee Queen. In the forest, we find the two locked in battle. The war chief faces storm rage alone. I must. Ah, sour fang. An audience. Perfect. Stay still, Alliance dog. Watch me strike down one of your greatest heroes. A dishonorable blow. I. Regret it. Regret nothing. You did well. It was not my place to interfere. My victory was inevitable. He was merely wasting my time. Finish him and be done with it. Take a moment if you like. Then take his head. Meet me at the World Tree. You have led your horde in service of death. You will regret this day. Malfurion, no! You did not kill him, Orc. Why? I struck without honor. I did not deserve to end him. This entire war is without honor. How dare you spill so much innocent blood for nothing? Not for nothing. We spill blood so that the Horde will endure. Because you spared Malfurion, I will offer you a choice. Attempt to stop me from taking him away and die, or remain there kneeling in the dirt and live. You have a choice as well. Take him to Darnassus and both of you will fall when we conquer it. Or flee somewhere far from here, so that you both survive. Come, champion. We must follow our war chief to... victory. This war is lost. Teldrassil will soon fall. Take my hippogriff to Darnassus. Ensure that the hordes Occupation is as tolerable as it can be. King Anduin gave me a hearthstone back to Stormwind. There I will tend my love's wounds and help my people find respite from this madness. Despite her prey, her target being on the floor and at her mercy, Sylvanas decides to walk away and let Saurfang finish the job. He doesn't, and instead Tirana takes her husband away, leaving behind their people. Instead of trying to fight, rally or find a different plan, she abandons the battlefield and tells the champion to make the occupation of Teldrassil as pleasant as possible. Back at the war chief, we find a whole bunch of dead elves on the ground and Captain Summer Summermoon kneeling in front of her. We tell our war chief that we are ready. Secure the beach. Prepare to invade the tree. <coughs> Why? <coughs> Why? You've already won. Only innocents remain in the tree. This is war. No. This is hatred. Rage. <coughs> Windrunner, you were... 
defender of your people. Do you not remember? I remember a fool. Sylvanas Windrunner leads the Horde to victory, but a chance encounter, it causes her to make a decision that will forever change the course of history on Azeroth. She did not come here with the intention to burn the tree, but the words of the Laren, they change her mind. Some interpret that as the realization that even if they would capture Teldrassil, or even if they take out Malfurion, it would not be enough to crush the hope of the Alliance. She would have to take it further, and so it is that she gives the order to burn down the world tree. When I sent you on this mission, I did not foresee this outcome. Our attack was meant to end a war before it began. To capture an enemy's home and annihilate their leaders in one stroke. To inflict a wound that would bleed the Alliance dry. We have only partially succeeded. The Alliance will retaliate. They will come for us. For me, for you. But they are bleeding. Their anger will prove a weakness, not a strength, in the war to come. Rest while you can. Prepare for the battles ahead. I will have need of you. As a reward, Horde players are given a worn torn reins of the Undercity Plague Pets. A bet that's apparently from the future, as it has a rather interesting Mount Journal description. Meanwhile, the Alliance goes back to their Nasus in an attempt to make the occupation as tolerable as possible, but that's made rather difficult with the tree being on fire. Ballistra Starbreeze, the same Starbreeze from the Scythe of Alun. She's looking for a child, Ishala, but there are more citizens that are trapped by the flames. Mia Greymane, Queen of Gilneas, she wants us to help evacuate as many civilians as we can. Time is against us though, and there are so many of them. The heat of the flames, it saps at our strength, until our body becomes heavy as our lungs fill with smoke. Hero, hero, can you hear me? I am relieved. I found you. Astari, hurry! Evacuate the city before it burns! 
Mia! Mia! Open your eyes, my queen! My love! You can't stay here any longer! We must escape through the portal! The tree! They're burning the tree! <coughs> the child! Save her! Leave me! Never! I'll take you both! Astari, you've done all you can! Command the priest to come with us! They will not go. The Banshee murdered my son, stole my kingdom. She will not cost me, my beloved! May your goddess watch over you. A starry star seeker and the priestesses, they decide to stay behind. Will we jump through a portal and leave behind the burning Teldrassil? Endwin is filled in on the news, and he is at a loss for words. You are always. You have shown courage and heart, champion. On this, one of the Alliance's darkest days. My whole life, I've prayed for peace in this world. But that dream can never be realized so long as Sylvanas Windrunner leads the Horde. She expects this atrocity to crush our spirits, shatter our unity. But this I vow. The Alliance will endure. And the Banshee Queen's insidious reign will be ended. As a reward, members of the Alliance, they receive the smoldering reins of the Teldrassil Hippogriff, one of the last great armored hippogriffs to escape the burning of Teldrassil. It carried the last citizens that could to safety, before collapsing of exhaustion. And that's the War of Force campaign, which leads into Battle for Azeroth and the Siege of Lordaeron. Now I spewed my opinion on stream and during my reaction video, in which I had some problems with the storyline. You might have caught some of the sarcastic remarks that I made, but here's the thing. The Battle for Azeroth Collector's Edition, it has stories that are not so much short stories, rather they're 70-ish pages each, including artwork. The book, which if I got it right, should also become available online, it tells not so much a different story than what we see going down, rather a much more detailed one, up to the point where I seriously sit back, I scratch my head and I wonder, why don't we see this in game? So one of my biggest complaints, that was the motivation behind this war. Sylvanas, she wants to stay alive and she mentions Anduin by name, accusing him of things that she's been doing and I would have much rather seen them use the alliance as a whole, see some sort of threat there, not just Anduin that's been known to keep the peace. We also have past motivations as seen on the PTR that has been changed in between, but here's the motivation that they describe it as in the story A Good War. You are not Garrosh Hellscream. Why do you want to throw the horde into the meat grinder again? Sylvanas' eyes did not waver, even in the face of his rage. If I dedicated myself to peace with the Alliance, would it last a year? Yes, said Sourfang curtly. How about two years? Five? Ten? Fifty? Sourfang felt the trap closing in on him, and he did not like it. We fought side by side against the Burning Legion. That creates bonds that are not easily broken. Time breaks every bond. Sylvanas leaned across the table. Her words flew like arrows. What do you believe? Will peace last five years or fifty? He leaned forward too, his face is inches away from hers. Neither blinked. What I believe doesn't matter, Warchief. What do you believe? I believe the exiles of Gilneas will never forgive the Horde for driving them away. I believe the living humans of Lordaeron think it's blasphemy that my people still hold their city. I believe the ancient divide between our allies in Silvermoon and their kin in Darnassus is not easily mended. There was a smile on Sylvanas' face. It was not a pleasant one. I believe the Darkspear tribe hasn't forgotten who drove them from the islands, she continued. I believe every orc your age remembers being imprisoned for years in filthy camps, wallowing in despair and surviving on human scraps. I believe every human remembers the tales of the terrible horde that caused so much destruction in its first invasion. And I believe they blame every orc for that, no matter what your people have done to redeem yourselves. And I remember very well that my first Forsaken were once loyal Alliance citizens. We died for that banner, and our reward was to be hunted as vermin. I believe that there will be no permanent peace with the Alliance, not unless we win it on the battlefield on our terms. And believing that, answer this, Sour Fang. What use is delaying the inevitable? The boy in Stormwind will not start a war tomorrow, Sour Fang said, his eyebrows lowered. With Ken Greyman in his ears? We will see. That was a concern, Sour Fang had to concede. In the thick of fighting against the Burning Legion, Greymane had launched a mission to kill Sylvanas. It had gotten some of Stormwind's few remaining airships destroyed. 
There were whispers that Greymane had ordered an attack without Anduin's permission. But as far as Sao Feng knew, Greymane had not been punished. The implications of that were troubling. And every possible explanation, it led to the same conclusion. The old Worgen would always drive the Alliance towards war against the Horde. Sylvanus's eyes glittered. And the boy is becoming a man. What if the man decides that he has no choice but to launch a war on us? There is a bit more, but you get the idea, right? They use the history between the Alliance and Horde to motivate it. In their mind, even a hundred years of peace, that would be a coward's bargain, if they could claim dominance, secure peace by force. Of course, you could argue that if time breaks all bonds, then what's stopping them from causing another war once they actually claim dominance? You could argue that words might bring them greater profits. You could argue that Order Halls still need a better explanation for turning on each other. But man oh man, is, is this so much better than what was portrayed in-game? Then the game plan, their tactics, it's still similar. Capture the tree and take out Malfurion, but it's explained in greater detail. The plan is to capture the world tree, to splinter the unity amongst the Alliance. They would seek vengeance of course, but they would have citizens hostage. They would not dare to strike at the Undercity for fear of their own people. It would even take them years to muster the fleet to attempt to do so. How would Gilneas respond to the Alliance reclaiming Teldrassil before the home of the Gilneans? infighting, Anduin in his new role of High King having to deal with a political crisis. The respect that the others give him, that's a courtesy and not an obligation. If the Alliance will not march as one, each nation will act in its own interest. Each army will simply return home to protect their lands from the Horde. One single victory, it would cripple the Alliance for years, it would destroy them from within. Then they could strike peace with the individual nations and carve them away from the Alliance, piece by piece. Dismantle. The Alliance. Calculating, cunning, and it might actually work. We do read in Elegy, which is the Alliance side of things, that the expectations, they would fail regardless of outcome, as Enduin speaks with Greymane. And what of Gilneas? What will you say to me if I choose to help the Keldorai first? Which he would. Especially if the Horde threatened thousands of prisoners, and Gen knew it. I cannot act if the Alliance is divided, Enduin said. That's what this action is intended to do, Gen. Not just take Darnassus, but to use it against us, striking at the very heart of what makes our kingdom the Alliance. Sylvanus is going to turn us against one another. That is the grand plan, and I was a fool for not to see it earlier. Gen was silent for a long moment. When did you learn so much about strategy? Anduin laughed humorlessly. I was reading when I should have been sparring. Well, you are a fool. Anduin turned to regard him, surprised by the words. A fool to think for a moment that I would withdraw my support because you are helping the Kaldori. Do I want my kingdom back? My people to return to their homes? Of course I do. Do I want it badly enough to allow innocent night elves to suffer? When they so generously have helped the Gilneans these last few years? When they mitigated the Worgen curse so we could hang on to ourselves and not get lost in madness? When they fed us, sheltered us, and offered us their home where we had nothing? Gen made a dismissive noise, somewhere between a huff and a snarl. No, I would never betray that kindness by turning my back on them now. Sylvanas certainly doesn't understand the Alliance. She is in for a rude awakening, and you can mark my words. I mark your words, Gen Greymane, and my heart is full to hear them. They are a beacon in a time of terrible darkness. Both men turned to see Tyrana standing in the doorway, still dressed in her priestess's robes. So yeah, union amongst the Alliance, but a much, much more understandable motivation and battle plan for the Horde. Unfortunately, those last moments, the passing the kill on to Saurfang and deciding to burn the World Tree, they haven't really improved in my opinion. The motivation for burning, that is described as inflicting the wounds that Malfurion's death was supposed to cause. But since Saurfang refused to kill him, she had to do something else, and in that moment, she decided to give the order. Saurfang screams for them to stop firing. This is not their way. This is not what he signed up for, but it's already too late. The screams continued. They reminded him of Shefra. He had loved the sound then. Smoke filled the air, reminding him of Stormwind, of racing through the streets as buildings burned all around him, finding cowering humans and butchering them as they begged for their lives. He had loved the slaughter then, demon blood pumping in his veins, and he had loved this war too, hadn't he? Saurfang did not move for hours, not until the screams faded and the flames had burned themselves down to embers. Before him stood a smoking husk that had once been a great civilization. Inside him was a feeling of despair, a feeling of shame. 
There was no haze of corruption now to soften the hotter. Sourfang would remember this moment in his dreams forever. He would relive his shame and all the new ones to come over and over again. You have let your horde in serfs of death, Melfurin had said. How could Sourfang face the soldiers he had let into the war? How could he explain what they had done? He couldn't. He would never know how, but the burden would be his. Always, until his dying day, as Sourfang turned away, he hoped the dead day would come soon. Do not grow old, if you can help it. The campaign itself in its entirety. It actually describes the Night Elves with a lot more bites, a lot more mini skirmishes here and there, and fighting back, rather than saying in the midst of battle that they don't even want to fight. The ending is absolutely heart-wrenching when they figure out that the battle that they knew from the start would be near impossible to win, that the battle is not going to end in an occupation, but in a roaring fire, genocide of their people. Mia, who spent her time until the final moment saving as many citizens as she could, she is saved again at the last moment. In her arms is the last child of the Calderai to be saved from Teldrassil. They named it Finel, the last, and the priestesses who remained behind held their people close. Astari asked the loon for one final blessing, not for healing or for rescue, but for mercy. And their goddess heard them as Astari began to sing. Sleep brushed her mind, feather soft, honey sweet. The pain disappeared and she let out a sigh. All around her, she heard similar sounds. There would be no pain in the lady's light, in the lady's love. Mother and child both slept, breathing gently despite the smoke. Her duty faithfully discharged, a starry allowed her own eyelids to flutter closed. There will be justice one day, but eyes other than ours will behold it. The last thing she heard was a cracking sound, and she slipped into slumber. Oh man, way more details than I expected to share, but like I said, this book, it just adds a whole lot more detail to the story. Details that, honestly, it should have been represented in-game, and in my opinion, it did not come forward well enough. There's also a mention of Sylvanas planning more than she tells Saurfang. A loon had intervened, perhaps it even stayed Saurfang's killing blow. And she wouldn't be the only force beyond the Alliance to oppose Sylvanas' true objective. I wonder what they're trying to hint at here, but as you can probably tell, I am very happy with this additional storytelling. Hopefully, soon enough the story will become available online, so you can read all the juicy details for yourself. And by all means, let me know what you think of it so far. Does this actually change anything for you? I've been loving the discussion surrounding the events. I do think it's time to call it a day though, as I've been going on for long enough. So as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. If you want more details on all the things that we talked about today, then by all means check out the Delayed Powered article in the description down below. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!